my name is Fiona Barnett. I was born Fiona Ray Holozak, or it's pronounced Holocek in Polish, on the 28th of October 1969 in Sydney, Australia. I am a victim of child trafficking through the CIA, Luciferian ritual abuse, and Project MK Ultra. Child trafficking is run as a single integrated world operation. This operation is coordinated by the CIA in collaboration with British and Australian intelligence services. Retired NYPD Detective James Rothstein was appointed to the first US task force to investigate this child trafficking operation, which he found went all the way to the White House. Detective Rothstein found that the CIA were behind a blackmail operation in which child prostitutes were used to honey trap and compromise politicians, military brass, top businessmen and key government officials. Rothstein, who arrested the key Watergate perpetrator, said Watergate solely concerned this human compromise racket and specifically was an attempt to obtain a list of compromised pedophile VIPs and their proclivities that was held at the Democratic National Headquarters. I personally spoke with Rothstein who said he knew of an identical VIP pedophile ring that exist, existed back here in Australia during that time and that an Australian intelligence officer named Peter Osborne knew the details of this. The Australian wing of this child trafficking operation is coordinated by ASIO, which is the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. It's the Australian equivalent of the CIA. During the 1970s and 80s, Labor Party politician Kim Beasley Sr. headed ASIO's child trafficking operation. Under Kim Beasley's administration, I was prostituted at age six years to a pedophile orgy at Parliament House in Canberra, where I was raped by then Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, Attorney General Lionel Murphy and Governor General John Kerr. During the same excursion, future Prime Minister Bob Hawke raped me in a suburban backyard near Canberra and former President Richard Nixon raped me in the back of a USA CIA military plane at Australia's main military airport, the one where Air Force One lands if it visits Australia. After this, I was child sex trafficked from Sydney Airport to California, USA in a cargo plane. I was gassed and stuffed in a wooden crate like an animal. During this trip, I was raped by media founder Ted Turner at a pedophile party held at Disneyland, and I was trafficked to the annual summer camp at Bohemian Grove, attended by notable politicians, businessmen, and other VIPs. I was raped by Reverend Billy Graham in a pink bubble-themed cabin at Bohemian Grove. Billy Graham told me that his good buddy, Richard Nixon, had recommended me to him. At Bohemian Grove, I was one of a group of children dressed as teddy bears and hunted for sport by men in the forest to the theme song, Teddy Bears Picnic. I also witnessed the ritual murder of a woman by male guests dressed in black Luciferian robes. I will now lay the foundations for explaining the relationship between pedophilia, child trafficking, ritual abuse, mind control practices, and the CIA's Project MKUltra. I was handed over to the CIA Child Trafficking Network by my paternal grandparents, Helen and Peter Holozak, who resided at 14 McAllister Avenue, Ingerdean, a suburb located in the Sutherland Shire, south of Sydney. I was 15 years old when our family discovered that Peter Holozak was not my blood relative. This news was well received since Peter Holozak was a sadistic pedophile who violently abused me from my earliest memory. Peter Holozak also abused my father and my brothers. My father, who has complex PTSD and is severely dissociative, once told my relatives, everything Fiona says about the Satanists is true, but we just don't tell her for her own good. Peter and Helen Holozak were amongst the large number of Slavic Nazi war criminals granted asylum by the Australian government through the International Refugee Organisation. The wave of Slavic Nazis offered asylum in Australia was documented in Mark Aaron's book, which is called War Criminals Welcome, Australia, a sanctuary for war criminals since 1945. 
During a 2001 episode of the television show Late Line, Mark Aaron explained, quote, most of the war criminals who settled in Australia were not Germans or Austrians. They were people from Central and Eastern Europe, from the Ukraine, the Baltic states, the Central European countries of Czechoslovakia, Croatia and Serbia. These people had done deals with Western intelligence organisations, having given them intelligence, were then secreted or allowed to go to third countries like Australia. The Simon Weisenthal Centre has a classification system whereby they rate from A to F how cooperative a country is with the process of locating, investigating and trying Nazi war criminals. Australia is ranked F, the least cooperative. Numerous Nazi war criminals settled in an area south of Sydney which ran from the Sutherland Shire to Wollongong. These people worked and orgied together just as they had done back in Nazi Europe. They carried Slavic, Germanic or Anglicised versions of their former surnames. The Holozaks sought refuge from retaliation from the Allies for their collaboration with the Nazis. From when I was six years old, Peter Holozak bragged to me about killing Jews for a living in the Nazi death camp located in Lublin, Poland. Helen was pursued by the Russians for her role in the Gestapo. Her father spent two years in a Siberian work camp for refusing to disclose Helen's whereabouts to the Russians. Polish people tend to name things after literal life events. The Holozaks named their Australian house Lublin and painted this title in a quaint folk art design on a sign that they hung at the front entrance of their Ingadine home. Peter named his dog which was a Doberman, Satan, and trained the dog to hunt and rape children. Helen, who regularly attended orgies with her Slavic refugee community, had three sons to three different men, none of whom were Peter Holozak. Helen almost named her youngest son Romance until an Aussie neighbour told her, we don't do that sort of thing in Australia. Peter obtained his Doberman dog from another Slavic Nazi war criminal who was granted asylum in Australia. This man supplied dogs to the New South Wales Police Force. He was also involved in the clean-up and disposal of bodies as a result of Luciferian ritual crimes. What people must appreciate is that the Nazis were Luciferians. During their height of power, the Nazis conducted Luciferian rituals in broad daylight in the streets of Germany. Luciferianism is a secret, multi-generational religion with its roots in ancient Babylon and Egypt. Luciferians worship various ancient pagan gods, most importantly Lucifer, but also Moloch, Baal, Dagon, Imhotep, Horus, Isis, Anubis and Seth. Nazism drew out and promoted those Slavics who secretly practised Luciferianism. My grandparents and the other Slavic war criminals who were granted asylum in Australia congregated here to covertly practice their brand of Nazi Luciferianism in Australia. Over time, the descendants of these Luciferian pedophile refugees collaborated with existing Luciferian dynasties such as the Kidmans, Conlins, Overtons, Huxleys, Cardins and Cumstons and infiltrated Australian government and influenced Australian law and policy. This is why right has now been confused with wrong, why the government bodies support the perpetrator instead of the victim of crime, and why our legislation is increasingly reflecting Luciferian pedophile doctrine. This explains why, for prime example, the Hu Australian Human Rights Commission recently defended a pedophile who lied on his job application about his conviction and they fined the employee for refusing to hire this pedophile. The president of the Australian Human Rights Commission who made that decision is one of my Luciferian pedophile rapists. Leonis Petraskis was a close associate of my Lithuanian grandmother, Helen Holozak. Like the Holozaks, Petraskis was granted asylum through the International Refugee Organisation. In fact, the IRO employed Petruscus as a medic for a period in Europe. Petruscus was educated in a Jesuit school. The Jesuits are Luciferians who practice ritual murder and child rape. 
an increasing number of Australian politicians who hold power now are Jesuits. Owing to his Jesuit training, Leonis Petraskas assumed the role of head Luciferian priest within the Sutherland Shire Catholic Diocese. Roman Catholicism stems from Mithraism, the ancient Luciferian cult in which male priests were married to boy brides, altar boys, and temple prostitutes, nuns, who bore children to the priests for ritual murder on key ritual dates. The Latin Mass is a whitewashed version of the High Luciferian Black Mass in which a newborn baby is ritually murdered and its blood and flesh eaten. This is the ritual that occurred at Bathurst City Hall in 1985, presided over by the President of the Australian Human Rights Commission. Most of my perpetrators were raised Catholic and many associated with the Catholic colleges located at Sydney University, particularly Patricia Ann Conlon, who lived at St. Sophia College at Sydney University. Patricia Ann Conlon, near Cardin, was the Grand Dame of the Sydney area. As Jesuit High Priest, Leonis Petruscus presided over Luciferian rituals committed in the following Catholic churches. Regina Collar Catholic Church at Beverly Hills, Sutherland Shire, which was gifted by and closely associated with the US military. Boys Town Chapels, located at Ingerdean, Sutherland Shire, that is Australia's first Boys Town location. And St John Bosco Church, which is op located opposite Ingerdean, Boys Town. Other key Catholic sites of Luciferian ritual were St. James Chapel, which is located on the Sydney University campus, and St. Mary's Cathedral in the middle of Sydney City. Luciferianism is arranged according to a hierarchical structure which vaguely resembles a caste system. At the very top sit 13 family dynasties, including the Rothschilds and the British royal family. These are recognised by cult members as demigods. Below these lines sit approximately 300 Luciferian bloodlines who are generally high IQ, although this tends to have been watered down in some families due to intermarriage. Below this group sit the commoners who can never attain higher status because they lack the desired bloodline. These are your random covens based on nationality. For example, there's a strong Scottish Coven in Bundaberg, which is a major centre of Luciferian activity in Australia. Uh, they can be organised according to sexual orientation. For example, Bond University, where I attended and was attacked, uh, has a strong lesbian coven. And gang membership, such as the bikey gangs, um, or you can just now have your self-style whatever goes covens these days. It is from these uh, lower lines that the cult obtains breeders, women who are forced to breed unregistered babies for sacrifice and sex trafficking. We refer to these bottom feeders as coven scum. Their behaviour is usually barbaric and requires constant management to stop them exposing the cult, and they show no respect for those in the caste above them. There is much jealousy and animosity directed by these lower members toward the bloodliners. I stem from one of the 300 bloodlines by my biological pe uh, paternal grandparents, not the Holozaks, who had the IQ of a toilet block, and so resented my heritage and status within the cult. I even question whether Helen Holozak is my biological grandmother and whether she used my father as just another prop to escape Europe. Helen lied to the European immigration authorities by saying Peter Holozak was her husband and the father of my, my father. But Peter Holozak and Helen were not married until they came to Australia and they married in Bathurst in about 1951. My real paternal grandfather was located in Yelenogora in Poland. I met him and to my delight, he was everything Peter Holozak was not. He was highly intelligent, very attractive and very personable and extremely ethical. At age 14 years, Grand Dame Patricia Ann Conlon chose me to succeed her. With Sydney being the capital of Luciferianism in Australia, this effectively made Conlon the highest ranking female Luciferian in Australia. I was selected based on my Aryan appearance, IQ level, bloodline, flawless body, strength, skills and teachability. Women with blonde or red hair were usually candidates and this related to the appearance 
of the Aryans slash Palladians that, as the history books well document, the Nazis aspired to. Bloodliners are encouraged to marry within their caste. The father of my children is of the Gardner Luciferian bloodline. He is the blood relative of the mother of the current king of who converted to Islam and changed her name to Therefore, my daughters are double targets of this Luciferian cult. I have striven to protect my kids from the cult's kidnapping and luring attempts. Cult members who serve in the New South Wales Police Force attempted to kidnap my 10 year old child in 2015. My efforts to fight this resulted in the New South Wales Police personally apologising to my daughter in giving her a police show bag. Child rape, torture and murder are routine pra routinely practised within Luciferianism for various reasons. One, these acts are established traditions thought to appease their god Lucifer. Two, some members get off on raping and murdering children, but not all members. The ones who like it were conditioned to be sexually aroused by it through being abused and exposed to such practices as children. Three, it is believed to bestow power on the practitioner. Sodomy is called the fountain of youth and is thought to transfer the child's youth to the abusing adult. Luciferianism is a cult. Cult indoctrination alone is a strong enough influence on human behaviour. But the impact of indoctrination is reinforced by fear of the consequences of betraying or exposing the cult. The number one role of Luciferianism is there is no such thing as Luciferianism. At age six years, I was well taught this lesson. I was taken into a national park. There I witnessed a man who was called a traitor have each of his four limbs tied to four different vehicles which drove at high speed in opposite directions. That incident taught me to never talk about the Luciferian cult in which I was raised. Mind control is a Luciferian tradition stemming back thousands of years. Luciferian offspring are trained in witchcraft, astral projection and psychic manipulation of the physical elements among other things. Children are tested at age three for whether they should be raised with conscious or dissociative awareness of their cult involvement. Children with strong ethical objection to cult practices are never made aware of their involvement. These children are forced to dissociate through trauma and their minds fragmented. My husband and I were two such children. My memory of my involvement in these cult activities were mostly dissociated from my everyday thinking. Some awareness slipped through though, such as when at age 12 years, the mother of my best friend, Fiona Lacan Uleva, came to collect me from my step-grandfather's house in Ingerdine to take me to her Macquarie Fields home for a visit. Jan Levitt overheard me screaming at Peter Holzak that he was never to sexually abuse me again by order of the Sutherland Shire High Luciferian priest, Leonis Petraskis. As we drove off in her car, Jan asked me what on earth that was all about. I diverted the conversation as trained, but I forever recalled the incident in my conscious mind. I also remember the time at age 11 years when I tried to tell my mother about my child abuse. I started the conversation by saying I was special. My clueless mother told me I was telling fibs and so I abandoned this attempt. When I was eight years old, my mother, brother and I painted a mural on my bedroom wall. I drew what I described as a Doctor Who time tunnel after the image seen during the opening credits of the British TV series. I was trying to tell my mother that I had just been suffocated during an Egyptian rebirth ritual in which I was placed in a grave over a decomposed body while the Book of the Dead was chanted. I actually died during that incident. I was revived and I awoke in Sutherland Hospital surrounded by concerned medical staff. I had a near-death experience while I was unconscious and saw a tunnel that resembled the one shown at the start of Doctor Who. I was trying to tell my mother what the cult did to me. My memories of Luciferianism immediately flooded to my conscious mind in the form of sudden onset vertigo and PTSD flashbacks after Peter Holzak was found hanged to death at Easter 1991. Nothing was used um, therapeutically, such as hypnosis or any other attempts to recall memories uh, for my memories to spontaneously return. The coroner's report ruled the death as suicide. However, Helen told me, um, told my mother and I that a group of men arrived at her house that day and ordered her to go shopping. 
On her return, Helen found Peter hanging from his chook pen. She screamed at me about this later when I visited her. You killed him, Helen screamed. I, when I visited her with my mother and husband to confront her about Peter's sexual abuse of me, also present were my half uncle, John Holizak, and my auntie, Anita. My uncle John pointed out to Helen that I was not even in Sydney when Peter had died. I was actually up in Brisbane. What Helen meant was, the cult killed Peter as punishment for mistreating me and driving me far from Sydney. But Peter Holizak was not solely to blame for my leaving the cult. Anthony Kidman, the cult Kidman's father, and Rosalind Francis Croucher, current president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, were to blame. I was selected as Grand Dame by my predecessor, Patricia Ann Conlon. Rosalind Croucher was ambitious, jealous, and wanted the position for herself. Consequently, after Patricia Ann Conlon's death, Rosalind Croucher sought revenge against me by organising the Bathurst City Hall birthday gathering in 1985, in which I was raped on an altar by B-grade actor Bruce Spence in front of a room full of Luciferian pedophiles, including multiple New South Wales police and Catholic priests. Rosalind Croucher presided over this violation of my human rights alongside New South Wales Police Commissioner John Avery, Australian cricket captain Richie Benno, an ASIO officer and federal police, uh, federal politician, Kim Beasley Senior. During that ritual, a fully pregnant breeder and her unborn baby, plus a group of approximately 10 children were ritually murdered on stage. The whole sordid event ended in a pedophile orgy in which I was gang raped by a group of people, including Rosalind Croucher, Croucher who urinated in my mouth. The Bathurst City Hall crime gave me grounds for leaving the cult. I had just turned 16 when I was summoned before the Luciferian Grand Council that met in Sydney University's McLaurin Hall. Sydney University hosts the Australian headquarters of the OTO, the Auto Templus Orientis, which Anthony Kidman and my other key perpetrators were members of. When I was aged nine years, I witnessed Anthony Kidman preside over the ritual murder of a young boy in Sydney University's Great Hall. Nicole Kidman was 11 years old at the time and she was present sitting in the front row during this murder. This was an OTO themed ritual murder with Kidman and four others dressed in rather camp theatrical coloured robes based on the Eastern Star Pentagram, which dominates the Alistair Crowley Thelema offshoots, including Freemasonry and the OTO. I bring to your attention a document titled Auto Templus Orientis, International Camp, Oasis and Lodge Master's Handbook, Revised Spring Equinox, 2002. Page 33 of this document lists the name Kylie McKinnon as treasurer of the OTO. Kylie was in a senior administrative position within the ABC Broadcasting Network in 2015 when the ABC TV show Media Watch publicly attacked me to the horror of child abuse victims across the nation for speaking to a press conference about my child trafficking experiences. The presenter of Media Watch actually is someone who works for British Intelligence. Page 22 of this handbook states, quote, don't sacrifice animals or perform any other actions or practices which might adversely affect the order's reputation or legal standing, including dot, 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 explicit sexual acts at official or public access events. Well, that's something you wouldn't read about in your local football club handbook. So why do the OTO feel it necessary to warn their members to not publicly perform ritual blood sacrifice. The Freemasons were also involved in my abuse. I was subjected to Luciferian pedophile rituals at various Masonic temples, including Anthony Kidman's home lodge at 317 Pacific Highway, North Sydney. My leaving the Sydney-based Luciferian cult left them in a pickle. A grand dame, assumes the position by drawing in the dying breath of the previous Grand Dame. During my Grand Council hearing, Anthony Kidman warned me I would amount to nothing without the cult's background and without the cult's support. True to Kidman's word, my ability in and pursuit of every one of my interest areas 
has been thwarted by cult members to this day. I will give you an example. 20 years ago, I worked as a parole officer. I was appointed to Burley Head Centre. A woman named Catherine Hand wanted the job of boss at Burley Head's office. So her mate, Rod, who was the regional director of Queensland Corrective Services, seconded the then current boss named John of Burley Head's office against his will to work at an office one hour's drive north of his Burley home. John had been boss of a fully functioning Burley Head's office for 20 years. Catherine Hand, who had a diploma in art and zero experience as a parole officer, was appointed to boss of Burley Head's office. Catherine Hand systematically bullied out the existing Burley staff and replaced them with young women. On one occasion, she pinned an 18 year old parole officer named Chris up against the wall. She screamed at him that he was a fucking idiot and she did this in front of the convicted criminals who were present in the office. Chris was a brilliant young employee who went to work on, went on to work for the federal police. One day, Catherine Heen took me aside for a little chat. Have you seen my ring, she asked me. She showed off her ring, which was an Eastern Star pentagram. This is my coven ring, she explained to me. Every two years, the women in my coven meet up, no matter where we are in the world. Fiona, if you play your cards right, you will go far in management within corrective services. Catherine Hand informed me that a pottery lecturer from Queensland College of Art that she and I had both graduated from was also a member of her coven. Disgusted with Catherine Hand's mistreatment of existing staff, and I'd only been working there three months, I was one of the young blonde bimbos she'd employed, I declined her offer by saying, sorry, but I'm not management material. The following day, I, launched, I lodged a formal complaint against Catherine Hand for her mistreatment of staff. Catherine then physically assaulted me by pinning me to a wall and sticking her face in mine. She gave me 10 minutes to vacate my desk. The Department of Corrective Services then sent me a letter to say that I had done nothing wrong, but that I was being let go because I'd been filling in for a woman on maternity leave. Well, this was the first I'd heard. I lodged a complaint with work cover. The government then hired a private detective to harass and film me at taxpayers' expense. The second in charge of the Corrective Services Department told my barrister that she could, quote, do whatever the fuck we like, end quote, to me. The latest workplace at which I was targeted by Luciferians was Bonn University. I was undertaking a two and a half year master's level forensic psychology degree. I was in my last two units of study. I had been very successful in my studies. My Bonn University supervisor, Norm Barling, who himself was a former Bonn University lecturer, contemptuously called my forensic psychology lecturers, Katerina Fritzen and Rebecca Dolly, lesbian witches, after these women lied to the Australian Health Board about me and so destroyed my psychology career, despite my excellent academic record. Their attack came after I rejected Katerina Fritz's sexual advances, which included two sexual assaults. After I objected in class to pro-pedophile lecture content, and after I exposed Bond University's cover-up of a child sex trafficking ring that involved the Queensland State Department of Children's Services, or DOCS as we called it. This ring was linked to a southeast Queensland DOCS pedophile ring that police raided in the year 2000. DOCS staff were intentionally placing foster children with pedophiles who were prostituting the children out. These child trafficking DOCS staff had passed working with children safety checks. My adherence to mandatory reporting legislation was supported by the head of the Queensland Children's Commission, despite university having withdrawn my complaint without consulting me. And this commissioner determined that there were indeed grounds for investigating my complaint. I was somewhat vindicated when Bond University forensic psychology and criminology lecturer, Paul Wilson, was convicted and imprisoned in 2016 for pedophilia. Paul Wilson published pro-pedophilia articles on the Bonn University website in which he claimed children were willing participants in pedophilia and not harmed by it. In the late 1980s, Paul Wilson organised a pro-pedophilia conference at the University of Queensland 
and in class he accidentally showed the end of a kiddie porn snuff film. Paul Wilson's wife, Robin Lincoln, also a Bond University lecturer, was on the advisory board of a Brave Hearts, uh, of Brave Hearts, a fake child abuse victim advocacy group which targets victims of VIP child abuse for silencing. For example, see the biography of Sarah Monaghan, the child TV star who was sexually abused by actor Robert Hughes on the set of Hey Dad TV show. Brave Hearts tried to destroy Sarah's case. After Paul Wilson was publicly exposed as a pedophile, Terry Goldsworthy, a Queensland police officer, took over Paul Wilson's position as head of criminology at Bond University. And he took over Robin Lincoln's advisory board role at Brave Hearts. Terry Goldsworthy, whom I've never met, misused his position as a police detective to communicate with the New South Wales Police regarding the complaint I made in 2008 about the Bathurst City Hall ritual crimes. I had come forward to Bathurst police detectives after Tor Nielsen, a fellow victim, reported to police that he saw 60 children ritually raped in the same hall by New South Wales police and Catholic priests who worked at nearby St. Stanislaus College. Multiple St. Stanislaus College pedophiles have since been charged and convicted for the ritual abuse crimes Tor Nielsen reported. Terry Goldsworthy lied by mission when he failed to include my age during this 1985 ritual, age 15 years, and reported me as an adult perpetrator instead of a child victim of child abuse to the Queensland Psychology Board. Goldsworthy said New South Wales Police had confirmed this allegation and, was the, and that I was the subject of a police investigation. I was not. I wrote to police commissioners in both Queensland and New South Wales who sent me letters confirming Terry Goldsworthy had lied to the Queensland Psychology Board and to the Queensland APRA office, the, the administrative body that oversees the psychology boards. I complained to the Queensland Police about Terry Goldsworthy using his role as a Queensland police detective to access, twist and misuse my private files, but they supported the perpetrator instead of me. Bond University's criminal behaviour was the final straw which prompted me to go public about my child abuse. The corrupt Queensland Psychology Board's support of UK sexual predator Katarina Fritzen's false and vexatious notification against me prompted me to lodge my own complaint against Sydney registered psychologist Anthony Kidman to the New South Wales Psychology Board and the New South Wales APRA office. Anthony Kidman was dead within weeks of my notification against him. His personal security team informed Sydney paparazzi that Anthony Kidman was placed on immediate suicide watch following my notification against him. You see, I was not the first to complain to the health board about Anthony Kidman. I have since been contacted by other Anthony Kidman victims of rape, torture and unethical hypnosis. Many of these victims were child sex trafficked through Hillsong Church. I found a strong link between Anthony Kidman and Hillsong Church. Hillsong Church was founded by pedophile Frank Houston for the sole purpose of procuring child trafficking victims and producing kiddie porn snuff films. Hillsong ritually abused children. The Luciferian pedophiles have infiltrated all areas of Australian government, education, health and human services. They now have control over the police, media, universities, defence forces, parliament, schools, health services, churches of all denominations, psychiatric hospitals and fake child abuse advocacy organisations like Bravehearts. You cannot possibly understand their pervasiveness unless you were raised in their world. I will now explain the link between Luciferianism and the CIA's Project MKUltra, demonstrate the existence of Project MKUltra in Australia, and identify key MKUltra perpetrators and MKUltra abuse locations. MKUltra subprojects were conducted in most Australian hospitals, universities, and research facilities throughout the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. MK Ultra's presence in Australia stemmed from a 1951 security military agreement between our country and the USA. 
This agreement led to the establishment of the Australian Atomic Energy Commission in 1952 and the construction by the same US company of two multi-storey underground CIA research facilities, one at Lucas Heights in 1958 and one at Pine Gap in 1967. Pine Gap served as the endpoint for all data collected over Australia. Sydney University was the centre of Australian MKUltra research. MKUltra university-based research was kicked off in Australia by CIA psychiatrist and hypnosis expert, Martin Orne. In 1960, Martin Orne conducted MKUltra sub-project 84 under the title Attitude Formation Decision Matrices at Sydney University during a two-month lectureship. Sub-project 84 was funded by the US Air Force Office of Scientific Research under grant number AF-AFOSR-88-63. A further $30,000 was provided by the Human Ecology Fund to study the nature of hypnosis process as it may relate to induction of a changed motivational state. Martin Orne's visit to Sydney University was sponsored by UCIFA, which is the United States Educational Foundation in Australia, and the Australian branch of the Fulbright Scholarship and Lectureship Program. The Fulbright Program was a CIA scheme for recruiting and training MKUltra scientists and spreading MKUltra know-how. Months prior to his Sydney University visit, Orne presented a paper entitled Antisocial Behaviour and Hypnosis at Colgate University at the invitation of psychology professor George Estabrooks. A hypnosis expert and self-confessed CIA operative, George Estabrooks once boasted, quote, the key to creating an effective spy or assassin rests in splitting a man's personality or creating multiple personality with the aid of hypnotism. This is not science fiction. I have done it, end quote. Subproject 84 aimed at determining whether the hypnotised people would commit dangerous and harmful acts they wouldn't otherwise. The resultant article entitled Social Control in the Psychology Experiment, Antisocial Behaviour and Hypnosis, was co-authored by Orne and Frederick Devins, a Sydney University psychology student. Their article, published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, 1965, Volume 1, pages 189 to 200, featured the following abstract, quote, Rowland and Young found that hypnotized subjects were willing to carry out such apparently antisocial actions as grasping a dangerous reptile, plunging their hand into concentrated acid and throwing the acid at an assistant, end quote. This publication also notes, quote, we wish to thank A.G. Hammer, then acting head of the Department of Psychology at Sydney University, for his cooperation with the use of departmental facilities, end quote. Beginning with Subproject 84, the University of Sydney became a major centre for MKUltra hypnosis research during the early 60s. Psychology professor John Sutcliffe led a research group that included fellow psychology professor Alfred Gordon Hammer and psychology students Frederick Evans, Peter Sheehan, Campbell Perry and Wendy Walker. These researchers all went on to make significant con contributions to MKUltra hypnosis research. Most of them also went on to serve on the False Memory Foundation Board, a CIA entity founded by MKUltra perpetrators and pedophiles to discredit the victim accounts of CIA child trafficking, ritual abuse and MKUltra mind control. In November 1962, John Sutcliffe published an article entitled Personal Identity, Multiple Personality and Hypnosis. He published this in the International Journal of Clinical and Experimental Hypnosis, Volume 10, 4, pages 231 to 69. Sutcliffe's study considered whether multiple personality disorder stems from hypnotic suggestion and if, quote, degrees of proneness to multiple personality are predictive of degrees of hypnotizability, end quote. MK Ultra Mind Control involved using unethical hypnosis to dissociate the mind and result in multiple personality disorder or what is now called DID, dissociative identity disorder. 
1963, Frederick Evans was granted a CIA Fulbright scholarship to continue hypnosis research with Martin Orne at Harvard University. In 1966, Evans and Orne assumed positions at the University of Pennsylvania when it was a hive of MKUltra hypnosis experimentation. Students Peter Sheehan and Campbell Perry joined them. Hammer likewise spent two sabbaticals in Martin Orne's USA laboratories during the 60s and 70s. In 1961, Wendy Thorne received a postgraduate research scholarship at ANU for studies on the placebo effect. After completing her thesis in 1960 at Sydney University, on post-hypnotic amnesia. In the same year, she presented a paper to the Australian Psychology Society on hypnosis and suggestibility. Thorne notes in her 1960, 1962 ANU thesis that, this study would have also lacked a great deal without the information, advice and materials supplied by Professor H.J. Isink. Hans Isink was the current director of MK Ultra Sub Project 111. In 1963 to 4, Wendy Thorne was involved in hypnosis research with MK Ultra Sub Project 84, Dr. Frederick Evans. She was currently receiving CIA funding via the Studies in Hypnosis Project that was directed by Martin Orne. Frederick Evans received a Fulbright scholarship to work with Martin Orne at Harvard in 1963. Wendy Thorne later continued to work with Frederick Evans and Hans Isink. During the 1950s and 1960s, most leading Australian universities had professors and students in the CIA's MKUltra program, including Australian National University, ANU, La Trobe, and the University of Western Australia. Most chairs of the Australian Psychological Society, the APS, the body that certifies our psychologists, were involved in unethical MKUltra research. These people included Hammer, who chaired the APS in the 60s when MKUltra began, and, the bon and Bonn University's first professor of psychology, Bob Montgomery, who conducted unethical experiments at La Trobe University in Melbourne in the 1970s, which left participants permanently traumatised. La Trobe University lecturer Gary Dorset wrote an article entitled Boiled Lollies and Band-Aids, Gay Men and Kids in Gay Information Quarterly Journal in Spring 1982 edition, in which he advocated for the legalisation of pedophilia. You will always find a link between MKUltra perpetrators and pedophilia. Bob Montgomery also lectured at the ANU. Leonard G. Huxley served as Vice Chancellor of the ANU from 1960 to 67. Leonard George Holden Huxley was on the board of UCIFA at the time it oversaw the Fulbright lectureship being granted to Martin Orne. Huxley was appointed to the board for the 1960 period and was also on the board of the CSIRO, which is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, with Richard Casey as the executive. The CSIRO was involved in MK Ultra research. Richard Casey helped establish ASIO and ASIS and helped secure funding for UCIFA in 1959. So there I've provided a very short introduction to the well-documented, irrefutable presence of Project MKUltra in Australia. My researcher, Steve McMurray, has uncovered much more that I do not have time to share here. I was subjected to MKUltra procedures on the campus of Sydney University. These acts of crime were perpetrated by Sydney University staff from the faculties of chemistry, medicine, dentistry and psychology and alumni who maintained lifetime association with the university. Other international perpetrators visited and used Sydney University facilities to abuse me. Most of my key perpetrators attended Sydney University together at a time when Sydney Uni was both the centre of MKUltra research plus the national headquarters of the OTO. Graduated Sydney Uni with a diploma in tropical medicine in 1957, while Dr. Anthony Kidman was enrolled. Kidman and Tim graduated second year chemistry together in December 1959, the same year future wife passed third year English. Holsworthy military consultant and anaesthetist Colonel who was also Anthony Kimmer's next door neighbour, and celebrated heart transplant surgeon, Dr. 
graduated in the same medicine class together in 1962. Actor who gang raped me with Kidman also graduated from Sydney Uni in 62. One of my abusers studied at Sydney University also. My recruitment as an MK Ultra lab rat began with my abuser, who was an expert in sea creature poisons and published papers on this in Papua New Guinea. He attended the Australian School of Pacific Administration, ASOPA, which emerged from Sydney University's Department of Anthropology. ASOPA was a cover for MK Ultra activity, weaponized anthropology, and MK Naomi bioweapons research conducted in Papua New Guinea. MK Naomi received CIA funding through MK Ultra subprojects 13, 30, and 50. Documents show in Papua New Guinea worked alongside notable MK Ultra recruits, including Margaret Mead and Hitler's chief bioweapons scientist, Eric Traub. A SOPA was founded by Labour Party connected Alfred Conlon, who worked for British intelligence. Alfred Conlon recruited anthropologist Camilla Wedgwood to a SOPA. Camilla Wedgwood had ties with British intelligence and she worked at Sydney University. Alfred Conlon also appointed CIA agent John Kerr, one of my rapists, as principal of a SOPA. Australian Prime Minister, another of my rapists, appointed as Governor General of Australia. People say they weren't friends, but they started off as friends. They were very close. After Whitlam threatened to expose Australia's CIA agents and shut down the CIA underground facility at Pine Gap, the CIA orchestrated a coup against Whitlam. The CIA employed their men to enact archaic legislation dismiss, to dismiss Whitlam on behalf of the British monarchy. Another of my rapists, who also worked for the CIA, he played a role in ousting Whitlam. Whitlam was forced into compliance since the CIA had him compromised as a pedophile. Alfred Conlon's son, Telford, not only studied with Anthony Kidman at Sydney University, but they later published research papers together. Telford Conlon married Patricia Ann Carden. Patricia Ann Conlon's National Archive file is currently sealed for reasons of national security. This indicates Patricia Ann Conlon's association with intelligence agencies and her role in the CIA's Project MKUltra. As Luciferian Grand Dame, Patricia Ann Conlon's role was to supervise the selection and training of children. This training included esoteric knowledge and skills and employed trauma-based mind control techniques. Patricia Ann Conlon easily transitioned to work for the CIA where she assisted in the selection and training of MKUltra child victims. Patricia Ann Conlon was publicly recognised as a pioneering feminist and communist who worked for Labor Party pedophile Neville Rand. Patricia Ann trained in MKUltra techniques while undertaking a postgraduate scholarship in 1964-5 at the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. MKUltra was rampant at that university when Patricia Ann was on a social sciences scholarship there. Professors Humphrey Osman and Abram Offer, Hoffer sorry, were the two biggest MKUltra perpetrator names after Elders Huxley. The Rockefeller Association funded Osman and Hoffer's research into adrenochrome. Adrenochrome is a chemical created from oxidised adrenaline. It occurs in the blood of traumatised ritual murder victims. When drunk, it gives the blood drinker a, high, a, a drug-induced high and it sexually arouses them. This is what occurred during the Luciferian Black Mass conducted at Bathurst City Hall. Anthony Kidman and Lee were close associates of Dr. Harry Bailey, who was trained in deep sleep methods by MK Ultra perpetrator Ewan, McCam Ewan Cameron. The CIA funded Bailey's MK Ultra deep sleep project at the notorious Chelmsford Private Hospital in Sydney. I was subjected to MK Ultra procedures by Harry Bailey in the presence of Kidman and at Chelmsford. Anthony Kidman was a psychology student at Sydney University during Martin Orne's experiment and lectureship. He later studied at the University of Pennsylvania with famous clinical psychologist Aaron Tim Beck, a False Memory Syndrome Foundation board member. 
At the University of Pennsylvania, Kidman became a longtime colleague of Martin Seligman, whose learned helplessness research formed the core of the CIA's torture program. Anthony Kidman returned to Australia in 72 after years of work at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, Washington, DC, in the laboratory of preclinical pharmacology, which was involved with LSD research and served as a hub of the Scottish Rite Schizophrenia Research Program. Both Jacqueline Goodnow and John W. Giddinger had, re had performed research at this hospital, and it was one of the, one of the major research centres for MKUltra. John Giddinger was the CIA's head psychologist. He was an absolute genius the world never knew. He developed the test battery, the PASS system, which is still used to assess potential CIA case managers and agents. Giddinger trained Anthony Kidman in MKUltra mind control methods and directly supervised the MKUltra techniques, techniques perpetrated against me. These techniques included torture, physical assault, sexual assault, drugging, electrocution, and unethical hypnosis. The mind control aspects of, aspects of my abuse mainly occurred at laboratories in Sydney University, Holsworthy Army Base, Lucas Heights Nuclear Reactor, and Pine Gap. Holsworthy is Australia's oldest military base. It is located south of Sydney near my grandparents' Ingerdine home. Holsworthy Army Base sits adjacent to Lucas Heights Nuclear Reactor, which is now called ANSTO, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. Lucas Heights Nuclear Reactor is a 20-storey underground research facility that was connected via underground tunnel to a seven-storey or so underground research facility at Holsworthy Army Base. Data and material collected from these labs were delivered to Australia's main CIA US military underground facility at Pine Gap. Holsworthy and Lucas Heights both featured underground rooms dedicated to Luciferian ritual and the worship of their ancient deity Dagon. All top Australian military brassy Luciferians, most un Sydney University staff were Luciferians. MKUltra experiments and end goal procedures were conducted using children as lab rats. These child victims were sourced from Luciferian covens, various cults, boys' town homes, Derrick boys' home, government and church-run juvenile detention centres, child protective services, foster care, police lockup, Catholic churches, child prostitution brothels, blackmailed pedophile parents, and Hillsong Church that was founded by New Zealand pedophile Frank Houston. Some children were kidnapped off the streets. Other children were specifically bred to serve as human lab rats, their births not registered. Children were imprisoned in cages beneath Holsworthy and never saw daylight. Children were tortured, raped and murdered in the name of national security with the full knowledge and blessing of the Australian and United States governments. As George White wrote to Sydney Gottlieb in 1971, quote, it was fun, fun, fun. Where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape and pillage with the sanction and blessing of the all highest? End quote. There were two main categories of CIA child trafficking victims. <clears throat> One, those considered dispensable and destined for murder, and two, those deemed useful on a long-term basis, which was a fate worse than death. I was in the latter group. At age five years, I was presented before a panel in the lounge room of Leonis Petraskis's Ingerdine home. This panel included John Giddinger, Anthony Kidman, and Grand Dame Patricia Ann Conlon. There, Giddinger asked me if I liked to be special. I said yes, and he laughed and said, We'll make you special. Immediately afterwards, Giddinger subjected me to a battery of tests at Holsworthy, including a full physical exam endurance testing, IQ testing, and multiple brain scans. Getting it then accepted me into the MK Ultra program based on my high IQ, creativity, physical strength and endurance, blue eye blonde features, bloodline and intuition. John Gittinger particularly sought my visual spatial cognitive ability or right hemispheric strength. The Nazis recognized Luciferian based esoteric knowledge and techniques as a power source that they sought to weaponize. That is why they travelled the globe collecting esoteric knowledge and techniques from the pedophile Dalai Lama 
and other Nazi collaborators. The end goal of MKUltra was to create super soldiers. They used child soldiers for this purpose. I was one of those children recruited into Delta Special Operations. Delta Force is comprised of MKUltra victims. I recently spoke with a former member of Delta Special Ops and I asked him about what I recalled. I picked his brain. He told me at the start he'd only heard rumours of a super soldier program with children being employed as soldiers, you know, and that they were trying to keep up with the Russians, but that, you know, everything went dark about this after a while. He said he saw nothing himself. But as I pressed for info, this ex-soldier started to dissociate, became indecipherable and began stuttering out references to MK Ultra programming cues that I recognise. So I'd say all Delta Special Ops soldiers have dissociated from their knowledge of the CIA super soldier program involving children. I knew this through getting up as the Jason Project. I was put through full military training at age six years and assigned to a small unit of all male soldiers. My basic soldier training was supervised by Colonel Victor Chang at Holsworthy Army Base. Chang was a CIA asset with training in brainwashing and torture techniques. The Australian public knew Chang as a famous heart transplant surgeon who was gunned down in a gutter in a manner befitting his true criminal nature. Chang's, assass assass uh, sorry, Chang's assassination was rumoured by mainstream Australian media to be connected with black market organ trafficking. My training was completed in the USA at age 14 years by Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino in a special laboratory established at Dulce Underground Base. Delta training included the weaponization of psychic ability or psychic warfare training. During the 1950s, the CIA funded John Lilly's development of the sensory deprivation tank and his research into brainwaves and altered states of consciousness. In his book entitled Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Bio Biocomputer, Lilly explained how children can be programmed MKUltra MK fashion using LSD and his sensory deprivation tank. Indeed, the most fundamental MKUltra programming levels that is Alta, Beta, Delta, Omega and Theta, are laid via LSD trips in a sensory deprivation tank. The brain naturally splits into five dissociative states, which is why there are five basic compartments. My five basic splits were organised according to an Eastern star pentagram shape with a gatekeeper placed in the Pentagon, which sat in the middle of five doors. During the 1950s, the CIA simultaneously funded Robert Munro's development of what is called the Gateway Experience or Hemispheric Synchronisation. This is commonly known as astral projection. Newspapers and army documents record that the US Army sent soldiers to Monroe for training in the Gateway process. In the UK, standard military police training 25 years ago consisted of remote viewing or astral projection, which enabled MPs to patrol UK bases located in foreign territories just by lying in a bed. I bring your attention to a US military document approved for release by the CIA in 2010. The document dated 9th of June, 1983, is addressed to the commander of US Army Operational Group at Fort Meade, by Lieutenant Colonel Wayne M. McDonnell. The subject heading reads, Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process. This document describes the physics behind interdimensional astral projection as engaged in by the US military. I bring your attention to a January 14, 1953 memo entitled, Interrogation Techniques. Techniques. This states, quote, if the services of Major Louis J. West, United States Air Force, MC, a trained hypnotist, can be obtained and another man well grounded in conventional psychological interrogation and polygraph techniques, and the services of Lieutenant Colonel Deleted, a well balanced interrogation research centre could be established in an especially selected location. Major Louis J. West coordinated MKUltra experiments at UCLA. Documented in mainstream newspapers and magazines, including Psychology Today, these experiments involved behavioural conditioning 
of autistic children using cattle prods, physical violence and electrocution via an electrified metal floor. West hired Ivar Lavas to conduct the experiments, who in turn regularly consulted the father of oak print conditioning, B.F. Skinner. I know the names of the two men um, whose names are not included in the above document. They were John Gittinger and Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino. I know the location of the research centre. <coughs> it was built at the underground military base located near Dulcity, New Mexico. A circa 1956 untitled document describes the research centre or laboratory which the CIA constructed at Dulce. Quote, this laboratory will include a special chamber in which all psychologically significant aspects of the environment can be controlled. This chamber will contain, among other things, a broad spectrum polygraph for simultaneous recordings of a variety of psychophysiological reactions of the individual being studied. In this setting, the various hypnotic, pharmacologic and sensory environmental variables will be manipulated in a controlled fashion and quantitative continuous recordings of the reactions of the experimental subjects will be made. The chamber at Dulcie was an upright version of John C. Lilly's sensory deprivation tank. Lilly's sensory deprivation chamber was combined with the gateway process to develop MK ultra victim psychic abilities and to engage in the extreme interdimensional astral travel, which included contacting and communicating with interdimensional entities as described in the Fort Meade document released by the CIA in 2010. According to US military documents, candidates for the gateway process required high intelligence, imagination and creativity. The very characteristic CIA psychologist John Gittinger assessed me for. Gittinger was particularly interested in right hemispheric functioning. High IQ children have a visual spatial learning preference. When they perform cognitive tasks, both brain hemispheres are activated. As compared to individuals of average intelligence who, uh, when they perform cognitive, cognitive tasks, only their left hemisphere lights up. High visual spatial processing ability was essential for visualisation during MK Ultra training and for the gateway process. That is why getting a test of me at age five years using the Stanford BNALM and the block design subtest of the Weschler series, which are the best measures of visual spatial IQ ever developed. Following training, my unit and I were deployed to South America where the CIA were conducting operations against so-called communist governments. When I was a child, the CIA said our enemy was communism. Today, the CIA says our enemy is terrorism. The CIA continue to make money out of child trafficking by laundering it through banks and funneling it into CIA terror organisations that have decimated Syria and other nations. In 2016, Syria's representative to the United Nations publicly stated twice that ISIS forces were armed with genetically modified super soldiers produced and supplied in the USA. In 2015, seven foot tall genetically modified super soldiers were filmed beheading 21 Christians in Egypt during the CIA orchestrated Arab uprising. These super soldiers are described as Caucasian and not Arabic in appearance. They resemble the super soldiers developed at Pine Gap and Dulcie 45 years ago. Putin recently said Russia are developing super soldiers that are, quote, worse than nuclear bombs, end quote. I know what that means. Australia's Commonwealth Bank was recently fined $700 million for 54,000 breaches of anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism financing laws. Nicole Rose, head of Austrac, the organisation investigating money laundering by our banks, said it involves organised crime, child exploitation and drug importation. Our main federal bank in Australia laundered money obtained from child sex trafficking and funneled that money into international terrorist activities. I reiterate, child trafficking is run as a single integrated world operation. This operation is coordinated by the CIA. I bring your attention to a 1978 book entitled Dope Inc or Dope Incorporated. 
The latest edition of this book was published in 2010, but I highly recommend the 1978 version, which is available free online. This book revolutionised the way drug law enforcement officers consider drug crime. It led to the HSBC bank losing its licence to operate in the USA. Dope Inc. authors found that drug trafficking is run as a single integrated world operation, from your cartels right down to the person who sells drugs to junkies on the street corner. This operation started with the Opium Wars, where the British monarchy forced China to accept heroin produced in India. Two well-recognised organisations stemmed from Opium Wars. p and Cruise Ship Line was established to transport the heroin, and the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, HSBC Bank, was established to launder the drug money. The court Jews that served the British monarchy, including the Rothschilds, managed the drug money that was made from this trafficking operation. Dope Inc. then explains how the drug trafficking and related money laundering operation established in the Opium Wars is the exact same operation in existence today. In fact, HSBC was only in recent years fined by USA authorities for still engaging in drug money laundering. If you follow the money trail, it still leads back to the British monarchy. This is the same British monarchy that I witnessed engage in Luciferian ritual crimes in 1980 at St. James Anglican Church in Sydney. The book Dope Inc. devotes a chapter to explaining the British aristocracy's involvement in an ancient Egyptian cult, how Britain started the drug, rock and roll counterculture in the USA with the help of the CIA, and the links between Egyptian cult practices, the counterculture, and the CIA, which was established by British intelligence. Dope Inc. explains how and why the CIA run modern drug trafficking and money laundering as a single integrated world operation. When you read Dope Inc., if you cross out the words drugs and insert the word kids, then you have a picture of the CIA child trafficking organisation that violated my human rights. I fought to make police witness statements about the crimes I witnessed and was a victim of. I completed four days of police witness statements and police commenced an investigation which included door knocking around Ingadine and raiding the home of my deceased grandparents. Police had promised to take another five days of statements, but suddenly everything was shut down. I later received communication from a lawyer who, who basically said that the Sutherland police detective in charge of my case was herself a child trafficker and basically a member of the pedophile network she was supposed to be investigating. The attacks on my family by New South Wales Police, ASIO and other institutions have been ruthless. I have documented these and even obtained photos of the military thug who chased me about Sydney when I tried to make police witness statements. It's not paranoia when you have photos. The way I have been treated for daring to speak up about my child abuse and for taking a pro-victim stance against Luciferian pedophiles has been far worse than my original abuse and other victims of this sort of thing agree with me. The authorities who are supposed to support victims have done nothing but sabotage my case. They have engaged in what I have learned from interacting with other victims as tactics typically used to discredit and silence victims. The current Australian Child Royal Sorry, this current Australian Child Abuse Royal Commission is yet another damage control and information gathering exercise. VIP child trafficking victims who testified to the Royal Commission have ended up being targeted for silence. The one thing the current Child Abuse Royal Commission omits from any of its writings, publications, anything, is the involvement of VIP pedophiles. Since I appeared before the Royal Commission several years ago, I have been contacted by hundreds and hundreds of child abuse victims. A considerable number of these are victims of what I endured, CIA child trafficking, ritual abuse and CIA mind control. It seems that I'm the only moron willing to talk up. From what these victims have shared with me, I now have a very clear picture of child sex trafficking in Australia. I will now give you an example of what I've learned from victims. The New South Wales Police were the subject of a 1990s Royal Commission conducted by James Wood. 
This investigation stemmed from allegations of child sex trafficking in Sydney involving the same Luciferians and pedophiles who trafficked and abused me. The Wood Royal Commission was a total whitewash. Commissioner James Wood covered up reports of child sex trafficking involving Hillsong Church, Anthony Kidman, Derek Boy's Home, Costello's Boy Brothel and King's Cross, judges, lawyers, Catholic churches, daycare centres and New South Wales police officers. Multiple victims named King's Cross underbelly boss, police boss, um, Roger Rogerson. Rogerson was responsible for the murder of Sally Ann Huckstep, who died after she wrote a story on child prostitution at King's Cross for a porn magazine in the days when porn magazines published pedophilia material. The clean police officer who refused to report Sally Ann's murder as suicide had his career destroyed and life threatened by New South Wales police after he testified to the Royal Commission against his corrupt colleagues. That police officer is still in hiding in a state of trauma. Roger Rogerson was never brought to justice by Justice James Wood. In 2016, Roger Rogerson was imprisoned for a 2014 murder. Another notable perpetrator named to the Wood Royal Commission was Bob Carr. Bob Carr served as an ABC journalist, Premier of New South Wales, and then Minister for Foreign Affairs in the Australian Federal Government. In 2012, Bob Carr and Kim Beasley Jr., the son of ASIO agent Kim Beasley Sr., who trafficked me to Bohemian Grove, attended Bohemian Grove pedophile camp at Australian taxpayers' expense. Commissioner James Wood covered up all reports of VIP child sex trafficking, ritual abuse and mind control. This is not surprising, considering James Wood was named by a victim Dean Henry and others to the current Federal Child Abuse Royal Commission as a member of the very pedophile ring he was employed to investigate. I will now mention the two most abhorrent and famous criminal cases in Australian history. One is the backpacker murders committed by serial killer Ivo Milat. The other is the murder of a beautiful young nurse named Anita Cobby. Anita Cobby's murder was committed by a gang of young men, including Les Murphy. Ivan Milat murdered victims in the Luciferian ritual manner. So did Liz Murphy, Les Murphy. The details of both murders have not been released to the public. I discovered what was done to Anita Cobby through two people who read her case file, a lawyer who worked on a case and a prison guard who read Les Murphy's file. What the public were never told is that Les Murphy and his killer gang made deep lacerations in Anita Cobby's body and had sex with those wounds. That sort of crime can only be learnt, and it is the sort of crime taught to child victims of ritual abuse. Both Ivan Malak and Les Murphy were abused and taught to commit Luciferian-style rape, torture and murder during their incarceration at boys' homes. Les Murphy attended Derek Boys' home where boys were prostituted by staff to VIP pedophiles and used for MKUltra experiments, including Subproject 74, the psychological effects of circumcision. I saw the botched circumcision uh, of one Derek victim who had his penis cut off make international mainstream news headlines. Derek's use as a source of MKUltra child lab rats explains why many victims' files were destroyed. Ivan Malat attended Egadine Boys' Home where, when he was 13, and that is where my father, brothers and I were abused and where victims were recruited for MKUltra experiments and Luciferian sacrifices. Ivan Malat was in the Luciferian cult that abused me and the Malats associated with the Holozaks. Ivan Malat sought victims to be used in Luciferian rituals. Ivan Malat procured boy victims for abuse by VIP pedophiles at Costello's Boy Brothel. Les Murphy worked behind the bar at Costello's Boy Brothel when he was only 16 years old. Also regarding Ivan Malat, he was a close associate of the dog breeder who bred dogs for New South Wales police and whose job it was to clean up after bodies were ritually murdered. So my final point is this. All major crime within Australia stems from the single integrated world trafficking operation that I've described. If you disband this operation, you will virtually eliminate the trafficking of children, drugs and guns in our society and perhaps worldwide. That is my statement. It's shocking, I mean, uh, it's almost uh, two in the morning now.
and Fiona managed to keep me awake. Um, I was shocked to hear the, the her, her uh, experience with, with Billy Graham, I mean. Billy Graham is viewed by, by many uh, Southern Baptists as, as, as a saint, as it were, they've written about him. And uh, when, when Fiona speaks of a personal experience, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about her safety. It's a matter of real concern, uh, even for, for someone like me to listen to the story. Um, I will not, I will not keep it uh, to myself. Uh, I wanted also to ask Fiona, um, what really caused her to withdraw from all this demonic uh, uh, kind of life? Uh, did she have a spiritual uh, uh, experience? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one thing that I will answer about Billy Graham is that Billy Graham was a 33 degree Freemason and I'm not the first person to name him. I know other Billy Graham victims and um, I urge you to interview Detective James Rothstein who worked on the task force into child trafficking for the New York uh, Police Department. The NYPD are an unusual police force in that they have officers all around the world. They're a, more like a international police force in a way, investigative organisation. And um, when I asked uh, Detective Rothstein whether he had heard about uh, Richard Nixon, he says, no, he had not, even though he was a Watergate arrester. Um, I said, had you heard about Billy Graham being a pedophile? He says, oh, yes, ma'am. He says, yes, we lots of lots of stories about him. So that's, um, he's a well-known rampant pedophile. Um, in terms of, is my life at risk? Absolutely. Uh, there's been multiple attempts to, to, to take me out. The way they like to do it is, if they can't physically get me, which they have tried that, um, it, it becomes more difficult for them as I'm high profile. So they want to discredit me. So what they try and do is try and set up people to um, sue me. There's been a lot of attempts to sue me. Um, and that way they can drag me into a court. Um, now, in terms of spiritual beliefs, um, and this is the real reason I'm alive, is because I became a Christian when I was 15. Um, I was raised atheist. My parents left the Catholic Church when they both were about 14 uh, years of age against the, you know, the better wishes of their families. And so I was raised atheist. In fact, I was told to hate God uh, by my father, who thought all, all pedophiles were... were um, all priests were pedophiles. So I, but I believed in God for as long as I could remember. And I used to talk to my parents about God. And I think it's because what happens with these victims of abuse, children such as the ones underneath Holesworthy, who I was caged up with when I was six and made to bond with them. And then uh, Colonel Chan murdered them all uh, as a trauma incident to, um, you know, get my mind control under check. Um, these kids, when I was caged up with them, told me about the light man and were sitting there because I was telling them about the world and they'd never seen the grass, they'd never been outdoors. And the one thing that will upset me is those children and that's the only time I'll get upset. Anyway, um, they, uh, oh, yeah, we, yeah, yeah, we've heard about these things. You know, I was describing what it was like to go in water and in swimming in the ocean. That, yeah, we heard these. Yeah, yes, yeah, um, the light man told us this. I said, well, what light man? And the light man, and, and, I, and they described him. I said, oh, yeah, I know him, Jesus. And so children in this situation, I want you to know that the, the one source, um, source of comfort they have is they're visited by angels and by Jesus Christ himself. And, and I've got to say that I've had Jesus Christ appear mid-ritual when I was 15, and um, everyone hit the deck. They're in their robes, and it was underneath one of the churches in the, um, like the dungeon, um, where they always have an altar underneath the main altar upstairs. And everyone freaked out, were clawing, clawing through the ground. And uh, later on, when I had to go before the Grand Council, um, talking about why I was leaving, 
not only did I mention Bathurst City Council, um, City Hall, what, what was done to me there, which was humiliate, humiliating, and it was not what you're supposed to do once someone had become Grand Dame and Rosalind Croucher planned that. Um, not only that, but I mentioned this incident that occurred around, uh, I think it was not long after that, where Jesus, I mean, I'm sure it was Jesus, just this white light filled up in the, in the room uh, mid-ritual. And I legged it down the street. Um, I left. I heard a voice saying, Fiona, do you choose to be in this? You know, and I said, no, help me. And I ran. And that's the last ritual uh, I ever attended. And I ran down the street fully robed. And I ran into a Christian's house. Now, I knew they were Christians because we called them lights. And we used to have meetings. I used to sit in on meetings where they would plan, oh, how are we going to get rid of these lights? They're interfering with, you know, with our work because where there were genuine Christians who actually prayed, and you don't get many of them, um, the Luciferians couldn't work their magic. They couldn't, uh, their curses, hex spells had no power. Anyway, I ran straight into the lounge room of this couple's home and, um, and, and they were watching telly and I ran in they, and I just said, pray. I'm fully robed and I said, just pray. And they did. And I got out after that. And when I had to go before the Grand Council after that, um, and give reasons as to why I was leaving. That's one of the things I quoted. I said, hey, you told me, first of all, you weren't supposed to treat me like that at the Bathurst City um, Hall. I said, the second thing is, um, you told me that your gods were all powerful, all knowing, all present, blah, 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 you know. I said, well, who's that dude that turned up, you know? Who was that down there underneath the church? And they all went silent and they couldn't answer. And I said, yeah, well, till you got an answer, I'm out of here. You know, and that those were my grounds for leaving. And forever, I mean, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have power over their source of power. Like people, if they want to know, do these spiritual entities that CERN Hadron Collider are making contact with and the whole reason for CERN, um, do, do they, you know, if people question it, just, you know, have they ever been to a seance that actually worked? Have they played with a Ouija board and had it work? Because this stuff works. And a lot of people know it works. They've, they've dabbled in witchcraft. and But there's a power greater than that. And I decided to embrace that source, which was Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. And that Thank you. I'm here. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. I would, I, would certainly, I would certainly review what you shared with us because I will, I will try to reach St. James in Sydney. Uh, mm. you, you refer to something that St. James Anglican Church yeah. uh, uh, still have, uh, yes, still have a uh, few friends of the Anglican Church uh, in, in, uh, in Australia. And, uh, and as much as you are concerned, I'm, I'm equally concerned your testimony you know, would cause many people to become sleepless um, for two reasons. First, because of what you shared. As for me, because of the fact, uh, regardless of uh, how much one wants to help to bring this to light, uh, to challenge the authorities, uh, those who are behind trafficking and uh, child sex abuse uh, will continue to be uh, few humans um, whom I wish will be empowered to, to, to reach uh, people with, uh, with guts, uh, spiritual guts, uh, to, to, to see to it that uh, what you've gone through uh, will not be the experience of others, not least uh, those people whom you mentioned in Syria and places like Iraq, uh, the many children who are now being trafficked and who have been abused over the last five, six years. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Thank you.